Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to be back here at Wildwood after being gone for the better part of a month on mission trips. Um, just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for supporting missions like we really do believe in every member of missionary. And um, these trips are every bit for the people that we're going to, but they are just as much, if not more, for us. And it was transformational for me, and I'm sure for um, a number of other people as well. I know for a number of other people. And so thank you for your support financially. Uh, I wanna thank my wife for allowing me to be gone for so long, um, and because that is a sacrifice. Um, it's probably also a blessing sometimes, but, uh, it's, uh, but it is good to be back. I miss them. Um, maybe a little word about the hair. Um, I, I, uh, if you hate it, don't worry. Uh, my daughter and wife have already scheduled a hair appointment for me later in the week. Uh, it's, uh, they actually do like it, but um, I'm not going to keep this forever. This is a, probably a one Sunday thing, and uh, uh, they're, they're not very much in approval of the big hair, so <laughs> that's going to that's gonna go. So no worries. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for uh, your prayers and your support in every way. I get, as Andy said, you'll hear more about, a lot more about the trip in about a month, but uh, I get, I'm lucky because I've just come off this and I'm going to sprinkle some stories in about our trip into my message because it applies. Um, but before we get started, before we get rolling, as has become my custom, I would like for you to pray. Um, and I wanna, want you to pray for two things this morning, predominantly. Um, the first is um, we, we encountered a, a, a witch doctor intentionally when we were there. His name is Senlik. I want you to pray for Senlik. Um, he very boldly uh, stated, I asked him about a skull and crossbones on his house, on his uh, place of worship. And I asked him what it was, and he was like, well, it's a good question. Uh, just like you serve Jesus and, and proclaim his gospel, I serve his enemy. And he said it with a smile on his face. And so I want you to pray for him that God would convict him, that he would give him no peace until he comes and realizes his error and that he comes to know Jesus as his savior. I believe that's gonna happen someday and we're gonna get to report that to you. Second, I want you to pray over me. Um, this was not a normal week of preparation for me. It was, so um, I'm coming in very, excited about what I have to say, but not nearly as prepared as I normally am. And so I want you to pray that the Lord would use me. And I've already preached this sermon once, so it's not like I'm... But anyway, pray for me, pray for us, that God's word would impact us. And uh, yes, Brian. What was his name again? Uh, I would say S-N-S-E-N-L-I-K. Senlik. Senlik. All right, so pray for him. All right. I'm gonna give you about a minute, pray out loud, and uh, I'll close that time in, in prayer myself. To continue praying while I'm praying. Father, we just, uh, we just lift up, send him to you. I pray that you would give him no peace. Uh, I pray that you would, uh, you would just do a work in his heart that he would not be able to sleep, that he would not be able to do anything until he realizes that he needs Jesus. He knows who Jesus is, but do not allow the enemy to win there. I pray that because he comes to know the Lord, hundreds, if not thousands of others will come to know the Lord as a result. Only you can do that. 
and not us. And so we pray for that. Pray for us this morning. Give us, give us uh, wisdom to understand, uh, believe, and obey your word and encourage us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying, church. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Winquist. I'm the discipleship pastor and an elder here on staff at Wildwood. And um, I'm glad that you're here. This is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Uh, in fact, Pastor Brian and I fought over who got to preach it. And I won. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, he, uh, he very graciously shares his pulpit with, with us, and I appreciate it, and I, and I love this passage. It's so important to me. Um, when, so when we were in Haiti, we had a lot of opportunities to preach the gospel. We would go around and give water filter buckets out and rice and beans and stuff like that, but we would make sure that every place we went, we would say, you know, this is a gift from the Lord. Um, it's temporary. It's going to run out, but we've got something that's eternal for you, and we would share the gospel. And people would often say, you know, I believe in Jesus. Uh, I, I go to church. I, I, I'm a good person, blah, blah, blah. And so um, that was very common. And what we would do is we would ask the question, so, hey, let's just say you were to stand before the Lord today. You were to die, unfortunately. And God would ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And that's where we'd start getting where, where their heart really was. And they would say things like, well, I've always gone to church, or an elder has prayed over me when I was sick, or, um, uh, you know, I, I just have always believed in God, or I, I do good things. And, and so, uh, really, where they stood was still in their sin. They're, they're still condemned. Even though they didn't realize it, they are not free from their sin. Um, I had, in fact, one lady, one lady we talked to, I, I asked her that question, I asked her that question and, and started unpacking what that was. And so then I went and said, hey, let's think about the Ten Commandments. I listed off a bunch of them and then I, I specifically picked out lying. I was like, have you, ever, have you ever lied? Of course, expecting the answer to be yes, I've lied. So that I could say, well, you're a lawbreaker, condemned, deserving of, of uh, sin and, and the, punishment of, uh, the punishment of sin. And, but she said, no, I haven't lied. So I looked at her for a second, and then I smiled, and then she smiled, and then all the Haitians that were around started laughing because they realized, and I said, that was at least the second time you've lied, it wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she immediately understood my, she understood my point. Um, but anyway, she's still... I don't know whether she made a profession of faith or not, but she heard the gospel and she understands now that it is not her that does the saving. And so a lot of people are in that group. There's also people, and I've talked with numerous believers here as, as a pastor, uh, and, I, and I would actually lump myself into this at times, where we, we know we have a relationship with Jesus, we know that he's, Jesus has paid it all, and yet we walk around living as though our next misstep is gonna cause condemnation from God like he isn't going to love us anymore because of what we do. Our passage today speaks to both groups of people. Uh, it speaks to those who think they're free, but they're not. They're condemned, and it speaks to people who are not condemned uh, in Christ, but they walk around thinking like they are. It uh, incidentally also speaks to people who understand their position in Christ and are living that way, and, and it is an encouragement to them. Um, so we're going to look at it right away, starting, we're just going to read the uh, verses one through four, and then we'll go back and unpack each verse one by one. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. All right, so as we're, we're gonna unpack each verse, we're gonna start in verse one. Um, the very first thing that, I, that jumps out to me is the word therefore. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, Whenever you see the word, therefore, you have to ask the question, what is it therefore, therefore right? 
What is it there for? And it's there for because it serves as a connect, connecting point. This is possibly one of the most, if not the most, one of the most, if not the most important verse in the entire Bible. Uh, at least it is that important to me. It serves as a connecting point of the first half of Romans, uh, and it connects it to the second half of Romans. And, and so we need to look at what comes immediately before it. It does connect all of Romans 1 through 8, and we're going to look at specifically how it does in a minute. But uh, I want you to see specifically verses 21 to 25, um, what, what Paul says there. Brian preached this last week. I listened to it, and, and, it, and it resonated with me. What he said in that, in that moment resonated with me. Let's read the verses first. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. It's all present tense. Wretched man that I am. Think about that. Paul, the apostle Paul, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, like half of it, says wretched man that I am. He says I struggle with, there's a war waging in my mind, in my members who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Um, I mean, just think about, like, if you when, you, when you get to that very last verse, specifically verse 25, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. That's in the present tense. Paul who's writing probably the greatest theological treatise of all time, not probably, it is the greatest theological treatise of all time, says that he serves the law of sin. You would expect that somebody would, that the next line would be something along the lines of, shame on you, Paul, why are you serving the law of, of sin with your flesh? But what, is, what comes next? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is an amazing truth. And, and what Pastor Brian preached last night resonates with me as well, or last week resonates with me as well. Um, he opened his sermon talking about how he wants to dispel the myth that as pastors that somehow we don't also struggle and wage war with our flesh. I experience that too very much. Every pastor on staff, every elder would say the same thing. It is a struggle. We still struggle, we will struggle until the day we meet Jesus. And yet, we can live in the space, in the tension of there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's an amazing verse. And so now we have to ask the question, what is condemnation? What is condemnation? Uh, condemnation is a legal term. It is one that, uh, the, a legal term that says, okay, you've done something wrong, and in, in, in view of the court of law, you've, you've, you've sinned, you've messed up, you've, you've transgressed the law, and you've been found guilty, and now here's your punishment. Whatever that punishment might be, uh, could be jail time, could be death, who knows. But there is a punishment, that is your condemnation. The same is true in the Christian life, you've sinned, and you have a just punishment that you deserve, which is death, and that is your condemnation. And so it's a really good thing that Romans 8.1 is saying there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, who is not condemned? Those who are in Christ Jesus. Flip with me, if you would, keep your finger in Romans chapter 8, but flip over to John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Um, I, I love that we, we don't really talk about, you know, it's not a ton of communication between who's preaching and the worship uh, team, but Pastor Andrew had a sing for God so loved the world this morning. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but it's appropriate, very appropriate for the subject matter. John 3.16, perhaps the most famous verse in all the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17 is also important. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, in order that the world might be saved through him. Um, and so, who is not condemned? Those who believe, those who are in Christ. Um, 
So those who believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so then the question is then who is condemned? Verse 18 answers that question. It says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Um, and so who, who is not condemned? Those who are in Christ. Who is condemned? And, and those, those who are not in Christ are the ones that believe. Who is condemned? Those who do not believe in the name of the only Son of God. So Romans 8.1 is very significant for this reason because it says there is therefore now no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. So the opposite is also true here. And Paul is just repeating what Jesus' own words are. Those who are not in Christ stand condemned still already. And so it's very important for you, what, no matter what group you find yourself in, what, what place you are in life, uh, you either are not condemned or you are. And it's all based on whether or not you believe in Jesus. More about that later. Um, kind of a, a way to illustrate that, I, I've probably shared this with, with you all before, but I coach, um, most of you know that I coach um, volleyball and basketball, pr predominantly volleyball, uh, predominantly girls. Uh, but I've noticed a difference in the way that uh, girls and boys approach uh, any game, really. Uh, and there are exceptions to every rule. Uh, some, not, not every girl fits into these categories, not every boy fits in these categories. But as a general rule of thumb, when, I, when I'm dealing with I'm a boy, and I definitely fit into this category, um, boys tend to think that they're good out of the box. Like, give me the ball, coach. Last second, I'm going to make the shot. I feel like I can beat anybody. It doesn't really matter who it is, no matter how young they are. I feel like I can, I've got a good chance when I'm going in the game. Um, and, and so when you're coaching a boy, one of the biggest struggles, one of the most time that you have to spend on them is convincing them that they actually need to practice. Like, there's... Yeah, there is something wrong with your game. You are not Michael Jordan. Uh, you, need, you need some work. Now, girls, on the other hand, I've coached so many girls, and girls have an amazing knack for like doing things perfectly, like really highly skilled players. And, and in practice, they play wonderfully. In the game, they get nervous, and they start thinking down on themselves, and they start wondering how their teammates are thinking about them. Oh, she must think I stink, and blah, blah, blah. All this stuff, when you start talking with them, and so I spend the most time with most girls trying to convince them that they are actually really good and just play as good as you practice and you're going to be fine. Um, and so, but we do the same thing in the Christian life, right? Or we do, we do the same thing with Jesus, I should say. There are some people that, that think they're good. I'm good. I don't need anything. I don't need Jesus. I don't need God. I don't need... But really, they stand condemned. They're enslaved in their sins. And then some of us are actually in a really good spot in Jesus, and yet we walk around and think, oh, woe is me. Uh, Jesus is going to condemn me the very next time I, I mess up. And so both of those are wrong. And, um, and, and Romans 8 uh, communicates very much about that. Uh, so what is it about being in Christ that doesn't condemn us? Uh, verses 2 through 4 give that answer to us. Uh, we'll start in verse 2. Uh, you'll look in verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Uh, notice that there's two kinds of laws here. There's the law of the Spirit of life, and there's a law of sin and death. Um, so we're going to look at, actually we're going to look at uh, the law of sin and death first. What is the law of sin and death? Uh, we're actually going to use Romans we're going to briefly go, so turn back with me to Rome, a few pages over to Romans chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to trace the concept of condemnation through Romans. It's developed, there's more verses than this about it, but I'm going to show you uh, some of them. Romans 2, verse 1 says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So who does the condemning here? You condemn yourself. How is, how is it that you do that? Because every one of us has done this. We look at somebody else and say, oh, you, you sinned there. That, oh, that was a mess up on your part. 
all along, every time we point at someone else and say, you're a sinner, we're condemning ourselves because we do the same thing, right? Moving on to chapter 3, verse 9 through 10, it says this, What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No, no one understands, no one seeks God. Um, no one is righteous, and, and we've already been charged. What, when, when we're charged, and actually Romans develops this thought that we're not just charged with sin, we're convicted of it, we're guilty. And verse 23 makes that point specifically. Uh, chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a really bad spot to be in. Like, we, we've actually done something, too, in order to fall short of God's glory. We've sinned. We've transgressed God's law, and so we fall short. 512, chapter 5, verse 12, it gets even worse. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. This verse tells us that we're condemned on two fronts. The first front is you're born a human. Adam sinned, and his sin was passed down to you and me all throughout our, our generations. So every single one of us at birth is born condemned simply because we're born sinners. The second front on which you're condemned, and I am condemned, is it says, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so not only were you born a sinner, but you also condemned yourself by sinning. Um, and so it's a really bad situation for us. Verse 18, first part of verse 18 says, therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, essentially making the point that verses, verse 12 made. Uh, one sin, Adam's sin, led to your condemnation and to mine. We stand that way from birth, no matter how good you think you are. Romans 6.23a says, leaves us with the worst possible news ever. For the wages of sin is death. And that is exactly what God told Adam and Eve in the garden. In the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will die. And that is what happened. We have, death has passed on to all of us. We stand condemned because of his death. That's the law of sin and death. You don't have a choice to be under that law. You're under that law from birth. But, there is also the law of the spirit of life. What is the law of the spirit of life? Let's flip back in Romans again to Romans 3.24. We've already read 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does verse 24 say? It says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That is good news. Romans 3, Paul didn't leave it just Romans 3, 23. Every time we see condemnation listed in Romans right after it, 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 it talks about grace and mercy. And, and here, even though we are condemned, deserving of our condemnation, we get the free gift of life and we get justification. We get declared not guilty because of what Christ has already done on our behalf. Skip down to chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. It says this. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. There's a couple of things that really stand out to me in those verses. One, that God would love me while I'm still a sinner. Uh, and, but that also that God would die for me while I'm still a sinner. And what is amazing, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but think about the eternal security that comes with knowing that God died for your sin while you were still a sinner. What does that mean? He died for you almost 2,000 years before you even took your first breath. And so God knew about every sin that you would commit before you even committed one of them, and yet he died for all of them. Even the ones that you're going to commit today, tomorrow, whatever, if you've already placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God has died for all of them. And, and so to sit here and, and, and live as though we feel like we're under condemnation when God already knew about all of it, and he sent his son, he actually preordained 
that he would send his son for you before he even created the world. Nothing escapes his notice. God is a God of mercy and grace and love, and he's already done everything necessary to pay for your sins at the cross. It was his plan the whole time. Uh, moving on to chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, we've already read that part, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Um, and that is, a, that is a good deal. So just as you stand condemned already because of your association with Adam, you can also be stand associated with the one man, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins in your place. And that's a much better place to be because it results in there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have also read the first part of uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Terrible news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, and so we get to the, then we come to the point, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you continue to do, but because there is therefore now no condemnation because you are in Christ Jesus, if, in fact, you are in Christ Jesus. Uh, in my experience uh, as a, a pastor, I've, I've noticed that there's uh, at least four types of people. There's probably more than the, the ones that I'm uh, categorizing you or me as, but uh, there's, there's at least four types of people. There's, there's, uh, there's people that think that they're free, but they're not. They're really enslaved and entrapped in sin. They, they think they don't need anything. They think, well, I'm good enough by myself. But the reality is they're actually enslaved to their sin, and they're, they stand condemned. There's also a second group of people are Christians that think they're on probation. They think they're on probation. Uh, what is probation? Uh, I don't... I'm not an expert in the law or anything like that, but probation is basically you've committed a crime, you've been condemned, convicted of the crime, uh, and yet the court of law somehow has some, some form of mercy on you, allows you to live with some semblance of freedom instead of going to jail. But there's a lot of standards and, and rules and, and stuff that you have to meet that normal citizens don't to prove that you really deserve to be free. But the minute that, that you screw up, you're going to jail. And a lot of us as Christians walk around living, even though we're not condemned, we're literally, not condemned means not guilty. Like we're literally declared not guilty, and yet we walk around thinking that I'm on probation, God's just, God's forgiven my sins, but the moment I screw up, I am now going to hell, or God isn't going to love me anymore, as much anymore. There's also people who, there's a third group of people that, um, they, they think they're on parole, right? I've already, I've been punished by God. I've, I've served some time. God has paid for my sins. He's freed me. What's well, parole? Parole is people who have been to jail, but they get, they're granted freedom for good behavior. And um, as long as their parole officer doesn't think that they are uh, doing anything wrong or inappropriate or, or violating the terms of their parole, they can stay free for a certain period of time um, until they prove, they've proven long enough that they deserve to be free. You are not on parole as a Christian. Right? You, God, isn't, God hasn't saved you and said, you know what, as long, now as long as you do all the things that I say in the Bible, not, then you, I will still love you. Then I will allow you to be in... No. God has canceled your debt. He's declared you not guilty. You are not on parole. You are free in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. There's a fourth group of, of people, and this is the one that I hope that if you're not already in this camp that you will be, whether, whether or not you're walking around thinking you're free and you're really not, I hope you end up in this camp. Or you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you are really free, but you're walking around like you're condemned. I hope you're in this final group, and it's Christians who are not guilty, they know they're not guilty, and they live thankful, free, and faithfully. All right? That is, that is the group that we want to be in. If you don't know Jesus yet, you can be in that group. 
Now, it's your choice. You just have to believe in the name of the Son of God, as John 3, 16 through 18 tells us. Uh, moving on to uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 3, it says this, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What does it say that God has done? God has done two things. He sent his son, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Notice that something is condemned here, and it's not you. It's your sin. It's my sin that it was condemned. Not me and not you. And that's an amazing truth, that what gets condemned is what we deserve to be condemned for. Um, and Jesus did that at the cross for you. What was the law able to do? Um, it says, where is it? Verse 3. But the law weakened by the flesh could not do. There is something that the law can do. It's spelled out in Romans. The law is able to do a couple of things. One, it's to, to show us our sin. Right? We, it, shows, it proves to me that I've broken every single commandment. All ten of them, I've broken them. Most of them many, many times. Um, and it also shows us our need to be saved because we stand condemned uh, because of our sin. It shows us that we need to be saved. Why is the law not able to not condemn you? Well, it's because you sin. And James 2.10 makes this point. It says, um, whoever keeps the whole law but yet fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. In other words, you break one rule, one time, you're guilty of breaking all of God's law. And so it's really an amazing thing that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because what I deserve is condemnation. How can anyone stand before the Lord and find salvation rather than be condemned? Acts 16.31 answers that question. Um, Paul and Silas were asked by the Philippian jailer, what must I, man, what must I do to be saved? Was Paul, Paul's answer was not, well, first you got to like, clean yourself up and, um, and then believe in Jesus and then stay clean. What was his answer? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's it. It's as simple as that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's how you stand not condemned. You believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So, uh, what is the purpose of Christ condemning sin in the flesh? Verse 4 answers that question. When you look at verse 4, it says, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What is the purpose of Christ condemning sin in the flesh? It's so that the righteous requirement of the law, you are required to keep the law. However, you don't. And so the law condemns you but because of what Jesus did on the cross in your place, the righteous requirement of the law is actually met in you and me, a sinner. That is an amazing truth, that you are no longer condemned if you're in Christ Jesus because Christ kept the law and yet died in your place. And, we, and, and the, the last part of that kind of opens up the rest of Romans chapter 8. It says... Uh, in order the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That according to the Spirit is very important in Romans 8, probably one of, if not the most important chapters in the entire Bible, is all about life in the Spirit. What does it look like? What are the benefits of it? Um, it's interesting that he uses the term walk. And I've used this illustration with a number of people lately, but walking is an interesting thing. It's an interesting term that, that Paul uses in a number of places throughout, the, um, throughout, throughout his letters. But what is it, why didn't he use the word run? Um, walking is a lot easier to grasp, a lot easier to understand. Walking involves one step at a time. And as Paul points out in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 to 25, sometimes we walk in the wrong direction. And, and maybe even run in the wrong direction. But what does Paul say we need to do? We need to walk according to the Spirit. And sometimes that involves turning a 180 and walking back the other way. 
We walk by the Spirit. And no matter where you are in terms of are you running in the wrong direction, are you straying off course, doesn't matter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That doesn't give us license, as Pastor Brian has said over and over again as he's preached up to this point, for us to continue to live in sin. It, it gives us freedom to walk in righteousness. And it gives us freedom to also mess up and realize that there is still, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the rest of Romans 8 answers this, the question, what do we get in the Spirit? And I'm just going to briefly give you a flyby of what we get in the Spirit. It's some amazing stuff. Um, in verse 6, it says that we get life and peace. Right? You get life and peace in Christ. One of the things that, that really stood out to me in, in, in Haiti was um, we saw a lot um, in both weeks, but this past week especially, we, um, we saw a few demonic possessions within like eight hours of, of each other. And um, if you read the story in uh, Mark, uh, I forget what chapter it is off the top of my head, but in Mark it talks about a, 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 you know, a child who was being thrown down by demons and uh, convulsing. And you read that story, that's what we saw. Um, Satan is very, very real. He does not care about you. You may think that you're free when you're in him, but you're not. Satan wants, uh, he wants to destroy you. Um, and, but Jesus gives life and peace. Verse 9, we get the indwelling spirit of God. The indwelling spirit, like God literally lives in people who are still struggling with the flesh. That is an amazing truth that God wants to indwell us and can indwell us even though we still struggle with sin. Um, if you, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, it tells us that, um, that, there is, that, that, that God is literally building us as a church, those who believe in him, building us into a place where God himself dwells in spirit. Among sinners, like Jesus, what Jesus did at the cross allows God to dwell among us as sinners. That's an amazing truth. Uh, verse 11, we get resurrection from the dead because of the spirit. When we die, the spirit can give life to your mortal body and my mortal body. We will rise again physically because we have the spirit. Amazing truth. We get adoption by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We get to call ourselves sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because the Spirit is in us. Um, John 8.44 says this, and this, this relates very much to seeing these, this, this presence of evil in, in Haiti. It says, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. He wants to, he wants to destroy your life, and yet you don't have to have that. You can have adoption by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who is not a liar. He tells the truth. He is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, remember, Senluk, he, he, he said, I serve the enemy, Jesus. I serve the enemy, that is Jesus. Um, and what we, what we um, and, and he, he was so bold about, about that fact. Um, and it was, it was hard not to, to jump in there John John, the missionary, had us leave, and they're going to go back in, and they're going to continue to work there, and we have to trust that John John knows uh, what he's doing, and we have to pray that he will see that Satan is the father of lies. He is, he is promoting Satan's work right now. We do the same thing in our own lives here, though, in a very different way. Uh, we don't see demonic possessions here, and you ever ask yourself why we don't? Um, is because we worship something other than, like in, in, in voodoo, they actually worship demons. That's what they're doing. They boldly do it. They know they're doing it. For us, we worship ourselves. Uh, we, and Satan's God is right where we want us, many of us, where we serve our wants, our desires, our passions. 
And Satan's the father of lies. And you have to ask yourself the question, am I getting what I want? Do I have life and peace? Do I have joy? John John asked that question when he talks to, to witch doctors. Are you getting the, do you have joy and peace? Do you have hope? I'm going to ask you the same question. Wherever you're at in your life, do you have joy? Do you have peace? Do you have hope that's promised here in Romans chapter 8? If you're searching for it anywhere besides Jesus, you're not going to find it. The only place that you're going to find joy, hope, and peace is in Jesus because that's the only place for it. Because he is not the father of lies. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We get hope. Uh, it's all throughout Romans chapter 8, but John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. We get, we get life and abundant life at that in Jesus Christ. What do you get from serving yourself or serving Satan? You get destruction. He's going to steal from you. He's trying to kill you. I watched... I watched teenage girls possessed by a demon. He's not just trying to attack adults. If you're not in Jesus, I'm pleading with you. Give your life to him. He wants to kill you. And even though he does it differently here, um, he is very much not on your side, but Jesus is. And there is there for now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 26, we get the spirit of Christ interceding for us. The one who died for us is interceding for us right now. We get future glorification. Okay. Sinners get to be glorified like Jesus. That's insane that God would do that for us. Jesus, we get Jesus on our side, verse 31. What an amazing truth. And, and it follows up, uh, verse 31 is followed up with, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the God who is for us gave his own son to show how much he was for us. Um, who can charge us? Who can charge us with anything worthy of condemnation? There's only one person that can charge us of anything worthy of condemnation, and that is God who gave his son for us. And, the, and also the God who justifies us. The one who declares us not guilty is the only one that can bring a charge against you. Who is the one who condemns us? There's only one person who can condemn you for your sin. It's only Jesus who died. Only Jesus who rose again, and only Jesus who lives. He's the only one that can condemn you. And so how do you suppose that someone who died a brutal death for your sins would condemn you for your sins? He's not going to. If you're in him, you are not guilty. You are no longer condemned. We get Jesus' permanent love. It says, you know, at the very end, verse 31, it says, uh, uh, or not 31, yeah, 39. 38, 39. For I'm sure that there is neither death nor life, nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is that important? Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's trying to kill you. Jesus says there is therefore now no condemnation. Ephesians 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Um, we need the armor of God. We need Jesus to protect us. You are fighting a battle every day, whether you realize it or not. Satan is your enemy. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. And he is an enemy that's too powerful. You can't beat him. You can't even see him. And you can't win. You need God's armor. You need God's salvation. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. 
So then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming, think about that. Whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with what? The breath of his mouth. All Jesus got to do is breathe, and Satan is done. All right? Satan has no power over Jesus. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He, use, he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness de- deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And so the thing that I want to live, leave you with today is do not refuse the truth. There is no other way. There is no other hope. You need Jesus. Believe in the name of the Son of God. What is our response to be? Well, if you are not, if you are, if you know that you're standing condemned right now, you need to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. You can do that right now, this morning. And I encourage you to do so. And as the moment that you do, there is therefore now no condemnation for you. For those of us who have already placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and for those of us who may do it this morning, the next step for us is to live thankful. Man, what a great gift that we've been given by God. There's therefore now no condemnation. We live thankfully. How do we live thankfully? We live free. We live free. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because Jesus has already paid it all. He's taken care of it all. And we live faithfully. We live for him because of how much he's done for us. Not as a uh, Jesus keep loving me kind of thing, but as a I'm free. I get to serve my risen king. So my closing question for you are, do you still need freedom? If you still need freedom, come today and receive freedom. Do you already have freedom, but are living as though you're condemned? Leave that with Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for, thank you that we stand not condemned, or at least have the ability to stand not condemned. I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, that doesn't know you, that still wonders whether or not they are uh, in you, that they would come and talk with one of the elders and and trust you and believe in you and and lean on you for their salvation, that free gift of salvation today. Thank you that we can, that that failure is uh, okay in your eyes simply because you are are the one that provides us our righteousness. Help us to rest in that, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.